wanted to say something. Uh, only that this conference uh, has uh, received a generous grant from the National Science Foundation. A little louder, uh, Richard, please. Uh, um, this uh, this conference has received funding from the National Science Foundation, for which we're very grateful, um, and also from the Department of Mathematics. And uh, so um, there are a lot of participants, and so we've tried to um, spread the funding around. And so sorry if we, we haven't completely uh, covered all your expenses for those who did get funding. We did have a rather strict cutoff, and so some of you maybe um, applied afterwards. Uh, but if, if you're in that situation, if you're a graduate student or postdoc, and have come and did not get the guaranteed uh, uh, funding from me already, uh, come and see me anyway, and we'll see how we can work things out. And if there's uh, if the money works out, so we can explore a little bit more. Um, so um, with that, I think I'll turn it over to Todd, who's going to do a round of morning session. All right. Um, uh, 25 years ago, I think, I was in an airport. And uh, it was, I think it was the San Francisco airport. And I saw our first speaker. And uh, I had, I think I had met him before, but I knew he didn't remember me. <laughs> and I thought, I'm going to go up and say hello to him. Because he's my advisor's advisor. He's my grandfather. Not only that, he's my advisor's undergraduate advisor, advisor Bill Thurston's advisor. Advisor to the stars. <laughs> Mary Lou, <coughs> and a friend of mine, also her advisor. So I, I know him. I know him. So I go up and say, and he's with uh, Charity, your wife. And uh, I go up and say, hi, Mo. Uh, are you Mo Hurst? I just wasn't sure because I, I wanted to say. And Charity kind of rolls her eyes and goes, did you have new calculus? <laughs> <laughs> and I guess. She was just kind of sick of the fact that she had to go around with Mo Hirsch. He's famous. He was a professor of Cal, uh, professor at uh, University of California at Berkeley. He was differential topology. Uh, Mo Hirsch. He's this. He's a rock star. And she was kind of sick of just being constantly bombarded with people. Oh, <laughs> Mo Hirsch. So they were very nice, and we had a very nice conversation, and uh, it was great to see him. And it's great to have him. He was one of the first people, when we're, when we're organizing a conference, who do we have to have? We have to have Mo come, we had to come. So, um, so without any further ado, my personal rock star and my <laughs> mathematical <laughs> grandfather, Mo Hurst. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, Charity will be the dinner. It wasn't, she was tired of people coming up to me. She was tired of students who maybe I did have in calculus <laughs> who, they knew me, and they were very insulted when she didn't know them. <laughs> well, yes, he was my professor in Calculus 101. Or we'd be out in the country watching uh, somebody we knew build, rebuild a house, and there'd be a guy with a power drill, and we'd say, Oh, Professor Hirsch, I had you in Calculus 101. <laughs> so it's wonderful to have former students here and there. Okay, so... Let me see if I can work this. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it works. And uh, happy birthday, Bill. I'll say some more about Bill at the banquet tonight. <laughs> okay. This is what I want to talk about. Common zeros and vector field and low dimensional real and complex manifolds. The reason for low dimensions is nobody can do anything on this issue in higher dimensions. So vector fields are a nice algebraic way of saying differential equations if you're in the real or complex field. And you want to know what happens in the long run. In particular, you want to know where the zeros of the vector field are. Those are the stationary points of your dynamical system. This is really important question. <coughs> Sometimes you have two vector fields going, and you'd like to know maybe they express different aspects of the same uh, so physical or chemical or biological system. You'd like to know, do they have a station at the same, do they have a common zero? And that's what this is about. And it's much easier if these two vector fields commute with each other. Or failing that, if they generate a, a finite dimensional in the algebra, 
And of course, no one's really, in dynamics, no one's interested in really algebra. They're interested in Lie group actions. But as we all know, a Lie group action is usually defined by its associated Lie algebra representation of the vector field. And they're easier to study because they are more linear. So the question is, if you have a particular manifold and a particular Lie algebra of vector fields, it doesn't have to be finite dimensional. Uh, does it, is there a place where they all vanish at the same time? And the way, uh, one way of approaching this is to take one of those vector fields and say, all right, we know where this one vanishes. Which other ones also vanish at that point? Well, of course, they don't have to. Lots of have rotations of the three sphere. Some vector fields vanish at the North Pole, but most of them don't. So you need some conditions on, you need some topological conditions on the manifold, some analytic conditions on the vector fields. Are they analytic, for example, or just the infinity, or once differentiable, or something like that? And then you need some algebraic conditions on the Lie algebra. So these three different fields of mathematics, which cover a great deal of modern mathematics since the uh, days of Lee over 100 years ago, um, the, the, these all come into play. And uh, one can try to grow and deep guise the whole subject. I don't think that's been done. Guerbaki doesn't say very much about dynamical systems, at least the one the parts that I read. And I don't think there have been any recent ones. So, um, let me, I'm going to state what this is about, and uh, so this is the introduction I just gave it. Uh, I'll talk the Poincaré Hopf index, uh, which most of you are familiar with. I'll define it all. Is the key uh, to the situation you assume that one of your the vector field that you start with has not only a, a zero, but it's uh, non-zero index there, which means it's stable under perturbations. And tracking is a new idea that's a uh, generalization of uh, commutativity or nil of the algebras. It's, uh, then I'll talk about some theorems. So um, let me talk about the Poincaré Well, this is notation. M and N are n-dimensional manifolds. So everything will be real until I say they're complex. And if I don't say anything, they're real. No boundary, except sometimes there is a boundary. Uh, it's better. It's interesting. Boundaries are really uh, sort of a bete noir in, in dynamics. You know, in, uh, a lot of subjects, for example, Atiyah and Groton, the Hirzebrook, they proved some theorems about an index vanishing, implying something for manifolds without boundary, and it took years before they could cover manifolds with boundary. So boundaries are really important in all sorts of fields of mathematics, although they're not always called that. And F will be the ground field, which is always the real numbers or the complex numbers, and unless said otherwise, everything is real. All right. Now, X will always be a vector field with a compact set of zeros. So, uh, the way everybody looks at this, you have a, a vector field someplace. These are the vectors, and you have trajectories of these curves, parameterized curves, tangent to the vector field. And you might have a zero point where it vanishes. And then, then it's very interesting. You ask, well, what happens near that point? Well, you might have some vectors coming into it, and you might have some going out of it. And then the eigenvalues of the vector field in these directions are important. Uh, they should hopefully be non-zero. Other trajectories might look like this. But you might have, of course, much more complicated situations. Uh, you might have trajectories like that or like that with other zeros. So uh, it's very important to try to find out what happens near the zero. Now you can linearize everything, linearize the vector field, now you have a matrix, and you can ask what the eigenvalues of that matrix. Uh, but you might have a whole compact set of zeros. So here's a circle in the plane, and I'm assuming I have a vector field that is identically zero on the circle. So 
Now what happens near the circle? Well, you might have some coming in. So I'm gonna draw this picture because it was you know, very helpful. So these, along these, the vectors, I've, I've just drawn the trajectories, the vectors get smaller and smaller and smaller until they vanish from this here. So let's imagine these are just along the radial lines coming in. So then you say, well, what happens inside? Well, I want to take a very peculiar looking vector field. So inside, everything's just going to be parallel, like this. And of course, these get smaller and smaller as you approach the boundary. So that's an interesting picture. Uh, and you can't do this analytically, real analytically, because of a real analytic, the vector field is always parallel to these directions, but it wouldn't be parallel to those directions up here, and that would violate analyticity. So, but you can do this C infinity. So this might happen. Um, now what happens if you perturb this vector field a little bit? Could you, make, could you make all the zeros disappear, for example? If you had this situation, where inside things are parallel, and outside they're also parallel, and the zeros are on there. Well here, you, obviously, you give a little extra push in this direction, and all the zeros disappear. Everything just moves from left to right. So, but there's something funny going on along this boundary circle. <coughs> in fact, you can't make them all disappear. And I'll give you the simple reason is, well, just look at this outside vector field. Everything's coming in. And you can't, if everything's coming in, no matter what you do, some things are still going to go in, and they're going to bump into each other. And uh, in fact, this is where the Poincaré Hopf invariant comes. So this is a compact set of zeros, the, the circle. You perturb the vector field in some way. For example, you could just shrink everything a little. It would look exactly the same. Or you could twist it. Uh, or you could just blow up the vector field here someplace. Instead of being zero here, maybe you would uh, do something interesting. But in fact, uh, you might realize that if you have any set of vector fields in the plane with everything coming in like this, you draw a transverse circle and the Poincaré Hopf invariant is non-zero. In fact, it's always the same according to the Poincaré Hopf theorem. <coughs> the Poincaré Hopf theorem uh, says to compute it, there was a quick way of saying it. What the quick way is, you look at the vector field as a cross section of the tangent vector bundle and look at its intersection with the zero section. So you got to worry about orientations, but that's easy to take care of. So you look at its intersection, you perturb it a little so it, at every place. Of, so let me draw another picture here. Uh, This manifold, the line, the tangent bundle, this is R, tangent bundle is R cross R, and the vector field is a function from, let's say, the horizontal into there, which projects back to itself, so it has a graph. It's just a function. If you project on the second factor, you get a map F from the line to the line, it has a graph. I like using different colors. <coughs> so that's the graph of the function defining the vector field. It's obvious, the intermediate value theorem, you can't get rid of these zeros by perturbations. If, if you had a place where the graph looks like this, you could just push it down a little, and that would disappear. But you can't get rid of these. And the Poincaré Hopf their Poincaré Hoffman variant counts these. Each one has an orientation. So this would have an orientation, say, if you go first this direction and then this direction, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. So the total is zero here. But you can't locally perturb it. 
but um, you can perturb it away. Now, I'm assuming the set of zeros is compact, and we want to keep that compactness. All the perturbations have to be, say, trivial outside some large set. That makes us be able to do the algebra. Uh, so this can be, so you can keep everything fixed out here and out here, and just pull this down. But if you had a vector field whose graph looks like this, and you don't move stuff far away, you can't get rid of the zero. It will always be a zero. It might move, but you still have zeros. So the Poincare alpha variant is just the intersection number of the image of the, cross set, the vector field, the cross section, with the zero section. So that's a nice definition, but what it, how do you compute it? Well, Poincare said you approximate the vector field by one which has isolated zeros. And you choose local coordinates. And it not only isolated zeros, but each zero, uh, the derivative is a matrix with non-vanishing determinant. Uh, it'll have eigenvalues and uh, add up those eigenvalues in the right way. So in other words, you make the cross section, make the vector field transverse to the zero section. And here I have to refer to uh, our dear departed Elmo Beekman Camper, who has a wonderful sentence, uh, transversality unlocks the secrets of the manifold. Yeah, that's certainly true. Another sentence from Henry Whitehead uh, was, transversal is an adjective. Transver uh, tr now, transverse is an adjective. Transversal is a noun. So you don't say, two he wouldn't say two manifolds are transversal. Transversal is something that's transverse to something else. Two manifolds are transverse. So I, I just throw that out. Those <laughs> <laughs> are like grammar. <laughs> so, so much for the definition of the Poincaré Hoff invariant. Make a transverse of the zero section, make them all, uh, and you take the, uh, you take the tree, you take the, I guess you take the derivative of the vector field, the matrix minus the identity, and take its trace. So, let's see how this works. And there's the definition of index that I refer to. The properties of the index. If the index is non zero, the zero set is non zero. That's an important definition. Because it means you can use algebra, namely the index, which is after all an integer, to tell whether there's a zero. That's really useful. And you can say, well, what if there are no zeros? How do you compute it? Well, you define it to be, uh, if there are no zeros, you define it to be zero, or you can use a fancy definition of intersection number. That's the next one is that the index, this integer, is stable under compactly supported perturbations. You jiggle it a little, it doesn't change. Well, the zero set may change. It may change radically. It may go from one point to a uh, disk or a canter set or a solenoid, but the index stays the same because you compute it by perturbing it to something nice. So here's a nice definition. If So if the manifold is an open set in Rn, Euclidean, so you just have an open subset of the Euclidean space, and the vector field is just the origin, single point, the z of x means the zero set. The zero set, sorry, is just a single point, then the index is the degree of this map. You take the unit sphere to itself by sending any point to normalize the vector at that point to be a unit vector, which you can do because if you're on the unit sphere, you're not at zero. If you're not at zero, the vector field isn't zero. So that's a nice definition and very useful because it brings in a map. It's very nice to have a situation that has maps, not just algebraic objects, analytic objects, dynamical objects, but actually functions. Okay. So where are we now? Okay. 
Poincaré Hopf theorem says, this is, actually Poincaré proved this for surfaces and Hopf generalized it. Uh, and it was further generalized by uh, Lefschetz and all sorts of people. But if M is compact manifold, meaning without boundary, uh, the index of any vector field whatsoever is the Euler characteristic of, of M. Uh, that's very useful. And there's versions if the manifold has a boundary, then you ask if the vector field should either be tangent to the boundary, you get the same theorem, or it should point outward from the boundary, and you get the same theorem, or it points inward along the boundary, and then you have to multiply by minus one to the dimension of the manifold. So, uh, <coughs> oh, I guess that's all there is on that slide. Oh, there is one. Wrong button. So, correlate. And this is extremely useful in differential equations. If the other characteristic is zero, every vector field has a zero. The research program is what I'm talking about. <coughs> Find conditions implying that a set of vector fields have a common. <coughs> to have a common. So, BK of M is a set of CK vector fields, continuously, continuous K derivatives. K is always either a positive, um, K is either a positive integer or the symbol infinity, meaning infinitely derivatives of all orders, or omega, which means analytic or holomorphic when M is complex. Just some short. And you have a set of vector fields. The point, the, this is Z of the set. Oh, sorry, that's, that's wrong. This should be a Z, not a V. Z of M, Z of, I don't know why. This should be Z of S. Sorry about that. It's not computers. <laughs> so the set of zero of a set is a set of common zero. So suppose I have two vector fields. Now this is uh, a term I invented. Maybe it's an old term. The vector field tracks y, tracks x, if the bracket, the lead bracket of y and x uh, is a multiple, scalar multiple of x. So the lead bracket, of course, is just uh, <coughs> uh, as an operator on functions, it's, I might get these in the wrong order y minus y x. So that's another vector field. The second derivatives drop away, drop away and mix. And we say, okay, so what does that mean? Well, before we do that, let's see, okay, is this just an, an example? Um, if x spans an ideal in the Lie algebra of vector fields, then that whole the algebra tracks x because the bracket product is by definition a constant multiple of x for any two vector fields. So in some sense this generalizes that. And we'll see why this is useful. And if you're in the case where there are infinite many derivatives, the elements, the vector fields that track x form a Lie algebra. That's just simple algebraic computation. And that's five dimensional in the analytic case. Nice to know. Okay. Now here, what's the, why is this useful? Well, if you look at the dynamics of tracking, um, consider the local flows. You, time t, you move parameter distance t along the trajectory of the vector field. So that's a local flow of the manifold. It shifts all the points around. Uh, so let g be the flow of x and f be the flow of Y. If Y tracks X, then for I mean, every X T, like X orbits there. Excuse me. Rather than F. You're right. That should be well. I'm oh, thinking orbit, orbits that, of the like flow. Yeah, sorry. an orbit of a vector field. Right. Uh, that, that's loose talk. It's really the flow that has the orbit. The vector field is <coughs> just a topological or algebraic object. So it means X orbits. So this says this is really useful dynamically. 
because it says, this is eraser. So here's the trajectories of x and y tracks x. Y isn't necessarily parallel to x. It might, for example, y might be moving this way. But it says y takes each orbit of x into another orbit of x for each time 2. So time, for one time t will take this trajectory to this one, another one will take it to this one. So it operates on the trajectories. Even if the trajectories are all mixed up, it still does that. And that's just solving some differential equation that follows pretty easily. So that's very useful dynamical information. In particular, down. <coughs> now this is getting into a little analytic language. If for some time t, the flow, sorry, the flow of, of g, the g flow, flow of y, takes a point p to a point q, then this local this is a local homeomorphism, G sub T. A CK homeomorphism, a diffeomorphism, or in K. It transforms the K germ of, of FS into the K germ, K germ of FS at P into the K germ of FS at Q. In other words, you have these two flows, the F flow and the G flow, and the G flow will take the K germ, that means in the local coordinates it's a K Schroeder Taylor expansion of the vector field or of the flow, it doesn't really matter which. It transforms it into the Taylor expansion modulo the remainder at another point. So this is analytic information the tracking gives you. And of course, uh, this is very useful. And we can see what happens in this kind of example. This is just to illustrate the importance of k-germ. You look at these two points. <coughs> so this is where all, this is the top of the circle. This is the bottom. If you look at this point, what's happening? Well, some points are moving down, moving toward it. And some points are moving this way. Now, if we straighten out, choose coordinates to straighten out that circle, to a straight line, it looks more interesting, more attractive. So make the circle a straight line. And now you can do that so that these are in the perpendicular directions. So this is the same vector field in special coordinates near this point. Now what happens here? Well, if you notice, these trajectories connect, go from one point on the circle to another point. So they have to go from one point of this line to another point. So they do this. So that's a very peculiar situation. Remember the vector field is zero on that line. Now, so dynamically this is a very interesting point. There's only one other point remotely like that and that's at the bottom where it's exactly the same but turned upside down. Directions are important here, but trajectories are. So now, if you have some, suppose you have something y that tracks this vector field, for example, it can commute with it. Would have to take, preserve the germ. Now, the germ, whatever germ you are at this point, is very different from a germ, say, at this point, because in local coordinates around here, it just looks like this. You got it. So you can't make this picture look like this picture. Because here, in this picture, near this very interesting point, trajectories start and end on the horizontal line nearby. Here, that's not true. So because germs are preserved, you can never transform this picture into this picture. Okay, so that, that's the importance of germs. They give you information on the dynamics the analysis. And, uh, and
and this is important, if xp is zero, then anything on the y trajectory of x is also zero, because it takes trajectories, trajectories and it's only one for them. So it preserves this, so the y flow preserves the zero set of x, in addition to having these germ properties. But this is a special case of the germs, but it's, it's useful. It's a little stronger than that, because germs throw away the higher order terms. This doesn't depend on higher order terms. And here's another property. Suppose at some point P, the two vector fields are, this is a wedge product. To say it's zero just means that one is a scalar multiple of the other at that point. That property is preserved by the flow, y flow of the praxis. Now, if you're in an analytic case, oops, I didn't want to do that. Analytic case, this condition is an analytic condition. So it defines an analytic variety. And that variety is invariant under the y flow. Well, suppose that invariant was a single point. It will be a fixed point of the y flow. That's a trick for getting fixed points. If you have an analytic variety in the zero set of x, suppose that the zero set of x is an analytic variety. And suppose then the y flow preserves that variety, and because it preserves the germs, it has to preserve the singular points of the variety, a place where it's not a manifold. And singular points come with defined sub varieties of various dimensions. Those sub varieties are also preserved. Now, if it happens that you have uh, a, sing a point on the singular variety where this, where, which belongs to a zero-dimensional sub-variety of singular points, then that's a fixed point for y. So this is a, a way of getting fixed points for y, and that comes into the proof of, of the theorems. Okay. So to save the uh, dealing with special cases, I'll assume all the way algebras I deal with are finite dimensional. And oops, G, that's curly G, will denote a Lie algebra finite dimensional of analytic vector fields. So if you have a Lie group acting nice analytically on the manifold, you get a Lie algebra, finite dimensional Lie algebra vector fields, which is a representation of the Lie algebra of the Lie group. So, theorem. Suppose x is an analytic vector field on a surface, so in a two-dimensional manifold, not necessarily in G. But suppose G tracks x, then the zero set of G intersects the zero set of x in certain cases, not all cases. For example, x might not have any zeros. Well, suppose n is less than or equal to 4. G is an analytic, uh, 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 an abelian Lie algebra. Everything in G can be used for anything else. And G is only two dimensional, meaning it's spanned by two vectors. And x belongs to G. In other words, G is spanned by x and some other vector field that commutes with it. So you really have two commuting vector fields, analytic vector fields. This is the uh, hypo simple hypothesis in this special case. Now, Christian Bonatti uh, proved in this case that they these two vector fields have a common zero, which is a, what it means to say that G has a, meets the zero set of x. Because, so, and this is a very important uh, predecessor of the theorems I'm going to talk about. And what's interesting is this, oops, well, n less than or equal to 4. There are very few theorems like this in higher dimensions. In fact, there's nothing, as far as you know, <coughs> dimension 5 and higher, except under extreme other hypotheses, algebraic or analytic hypotheses. So, but even to get up to dimension four is, is tricky, and the review of, math review of Bonani's paper says so this is a very difficult analysis of the varieties of the zero sets. And this really stimulated, this, this theorem stimulated all that we talked about today. Now, 
Now, suppose n equals 2, so we've got a two-dimensional manifold, and g tracks x. Everything's analytic. Then, we have a co common zero. Now, here, x is not belong a member of g. You have this vector field x, you have this Lie algebra, you can think of it as a Lie group, uh, or a local group, permuting the vector, the trajectories of x. Um, <coughs> Uh, now I'm assuming the key hypothesis of X that has non-zero index. Index means the Poincaré Hopf index. Remember, X is assumed to have compact zero set, and the Poincaré Hopf index is non-zero. So this is with a Spanish mathematician named Well, he has many names. <laughs> <laughs> Spaniards. Spanish and South Americans do that. Francisco Javier, uh, but he has some other parts too. He has a name that comes after Turiel. <coughs> so I proved this with him recently. I had a simpler case. There's a counterexample. This is not true in C infinity. So this is very strange. Something's true for real analytic, not true for C infinity. Well, that may be not strange to us, but it was strange for David Burkhoff, for example, who someplace in some popular article I once read in the 20s, I think, said, when he heard about the um, Danjois example of difference between C C2 and C1 homeomorphisms of the circle, one could have a cantor set of of uh, an invariant cantor set, and the other one can't. He said it's very strange that the differentiability, degree of differentiability, should affect the dynamics because this older way of thinking, of dynamics was just really physics done in a mathematical language. The dynamical system was really a model of a physical system, and nobody in physics worries about whether things are differentiable or analytic. <laughs> What they just assume whatever they need. So, but this is a very striking counterexample. So, there, on any compact surface, and here allowing a boundary, on any uh, allowing a boundary, there are two vector fields, such so as the first one has non zero index. The second one uh, not only tracks it, it generates this simple Lie algebra. The, the, the two-dimensional non-abelian Lie algebra generated, and, but they don't intersect. The zero sets don't intersect. Now, there's an interesting history to this. The first one, first, oops, wrong button. Lima, Elo Lima, is a Brazilian mathematician. He was a colleague of mine many years ago at the University of Chicago, and he proved a theorem like this for homeomorphic for, for homeomorphisms. Um, well, for, for lead group actions on, on the disk, which no differentiability, just continuous. And uh, Turiel, same Turiel, showed how to do this smoothly in, on all surfaces. And it's a very interesting example of, this is Lima's example, which I'll show you. So Lima starts with Two vector fields in the plane. Nice. Satisfying this relation. In fact, a very specific one, x is just um, translation in the x direction. And y is, I guess, up to sign y d by dx minus x. You, these aren't the vector fields he finishes with, so they should put hats on these. So he starts with these, so the x vector field is like this, and the y vector field is rotations. And x, um, this, this I guess has the right, y does the nice thing there. Y, y bracket x is minus, maybe it's minus plus here. He starts with these, and so, we have these two sets of curves in the plane. The x curves look like this, and the y curves look like this, up to the direction. So 
x doesn't have any zeros at all, y has zero here. Okay. This is in the plane. Or instead of the plane, being topologist, we might as well look at it in the open disk, the interior of the disk. So we transform it to a vector, two vector fields on the interior of the disk. But we do it in a special way, in such a way that Well, the boundary that, that in the interior, y, y still rotates like that. And what does x do? Well, x is going to get smaller and smaller as you go toward the boundary. Zero. So you, you put these in the interior of the disk, and then he extends the vector fields to continuous vector fields on the disk. In the interior, they still have this property which means that even on the compact disk, the flows behave nicely. And so we get, if you take a time t map of the, so, so you get this action of the Lie algebra, there's a unique Lie algebra satisfying this condition that's isomorphic to the, uh, yeah? So the x, the x curves are going horizontally. Right. And then if you rotate, they're not gonna be, the things you get are not gonna be going horizontally. Um, well, they don't go horizontally in the disk. So I said that wrong. In fact, in the disk, they, uh, they go like this. They don't commute these curves. It will take them. The uh, Y flow will take one of these curves to another one in the disk. This, this takes a lot of thinking about this example. But they do define two flows on the disk. They're not smooth at the boundary. They have two flows, and they have the same commutativity relations. Uh, so it's an, what he wanted was just an action of this group, this Lie group, which is the group of orientation-preserving affine homeomorphisms of a line generated by x and d by dx, x dx, d by dx. It's an action of that group on the disk without a fixed point. That's what he wanted. And gets it this way. But it's highly non-smooth at the boundary. You can double it, put it on the sphere, but it's highly non-differentiable. So he starts with this, and this was generalized by several people. Um, my former student, Joe Plant, in North Carolina, said you can do this on any surface, a compact surface uh, like this. And then I showed you could even just have local actions on surfaces of that same group behaving this way, no fixed points. Because if you have smooth vector, analytic vector fields that do this on a compact surface, non-zero Euler characteristic, they will have a common zero, which I proved with Alan Weinstein of Berkeley. And Turiel showed you can see affinity, you can, don't have to have a common zero. <coughs> So what's interesting is not necessarily the results of these theorems, but the subtle interplay between the algebra, the topology, and the dynamics, that, or the, the analysis. The analysis is how smooth are the vector fields. Okay, so I'll do Lima. So when I give a reference, the first one will be the most recent result. The earlier one is a similar earlier result. Now let's go into the complex realm. So, suppose you have a complex two-dimensional manifold, so real dimension four without boundaries, and you have a fine-dimensional Lie algebra of holomorphic vector fields. You'd like to know: Does that when will that Lie algebra have a common zero? So you've got to make some assumptions. As usual, I'll start with something on the manifold which has vector field X, which is analy complex analytic, as compact zero set, and its primary half index is not zero. And I assume G tracks X. So if you like, you can assume X belongs to G and just generates an ideal. That's a nice situation. But it's more than generates an ideal because 
uh, it tracks in the in the real sense. The bracket product is a real multiple of x and y is a real multiple of y of x. Now here's an extra hypothesis that's needed. Suppose the Poincaré Huff index of x, which is an integer, is positive and even, which is a very common situation. Then you have to assume that the Lie algebra G does not project onto SL of 2C. Why do you have to assume that? Well, Turiel has a counterexample. If it, doesn't, if it does project onto that, the lines are counterexamples in the paper we're writing. So that's an extra assumption. There's no assumption like this in the real case. Okay. Then there's the Lie algebra of G and the vector field X has a common zero. That's the theorem. So this is a very funny. So a lot of the hard work like this hypothesis is due to Turio. I had a much more complicated hypothesis. Well, it was simpler, but it was severe. So we can apply this. Once you have a theorem about Lie algebras of vector fields, you can look at the Lie group they generate. So here's an example or an application. So, so we think of a two-dimensional complex vector space um, lying inside three-dimensional vector space is just a hyperplane. Then if you look at the group of linear transformations of the two-dimensional vector space, if you projectivize everything, it takes a projective, look at the projective lines in C3, it permutes them. And that's an, in fact an isomorphism of groups. No, you don't have to worry about orientations here. So I'll, I'll consider GL2C as a group of holomorphic diffeomorphisms of CP2, and it's uh, easy to analyze that. Okay, here's a theorem. We can put pauses in this for some reason. So, so M is a compact connected complex two manifolds of non zero Euler characteristic. And G is a connected complex Lie group of holomorphic diffeomorphisms. You want to know, does it have a fixed point? Well, let's assume it does have a fixed point. Let's assume it has a fixed point. So this is a very common situation. For example, this group, GL2C, operating on CP2, does have a fixed point because it actually operates on CP1, and then you uh, add another dimension and the points of infinity there are fixed. Then there's a holomorphic diffeomorphism from M to CP2, which takes G onto this group. This is really the only example of up to group order morphism. This is Toriel's example, really. Okay, so. So that's sort of interesting because the big question, if you're given a, somehow defined, somehow someone gives you a, a group uh, excuse, of... Uh, excuse me for interruption, but one yeah. can take a subgroup of GL to C. But do you mean all the subgroup of GL to C? Otherwise, I can just take a, any connected subgroup of GL to C and repeat what um, you just said. You have no to fix points here. Yeah. So um, you probably go to subgroup. I should say it goes to a subgroup. Um. Ah, you're right, I should have. <laughs> you're right. Let's carry G onto a subgroup of GL2C. Sorry about that. Okay. So that, that's a fair one. I want to go back to real manifold, which was what I understand. Okay, now, 
Here we have a two-dimensional surface, an ordinary surface, M2, without boundary, connected. And we have a nil potent Lie algebra of vector fields, C1 vector fields. So it might be abelian, but it's not abelian, it has dimension 3 at least. There's no potent. No potent is almost the BN. And you have an element of this Lie algebra that has non-zero index. So now we're not tracking, we just have some element, not even uh, spanning an ideal, just some element of non-zero index. Then the whole Lie algebra has a common zero. So this doesn't have anything to do with tracking. Well, it does in the proof. And sponsor gave an example of this with Lie groups acting continuously on compact surfaces. The nilpotent Lie group. Um, the, the surface had, he assumed the surface had non-zero Euler characteristic, which means every vector field has non-zero index. And he, found, he showed, he generalized Lima's theorem for this situation. Lima dealt with two commuting vector fields, two commuting homomorphisms, or that is, action bar two. So that's an early theorem. <coughs> okay, this is an interesting recent theorem. We're up in three dimensions now. So this has to be Bonatti. Oh, but this, here we're only in, in so I don't want to show you that. Here we're only in C1. This is the new, new thing about this theorem is that it only deals with C1 vector fields that commute. Remember, Bonatti's theorem was about analytic vector fields that commute, having a common zero. This is, uh, they're only once differentiable. The trouble with low differentiability is you don't have really control over the sets defined by the vector field, the set of zeros. If it's only, C, if a set of zeros, Set of zeros of, a comp of an analytic vector field is an analytic variety, which has a very simple topology. Aside from the singular point, it's a manifold. If it's just a C1 vector field, the zero set can be totally wild, solenoid, cantor sets, all sorts of horrible things. Okay, so that's the first hypothesis. Now we need something more, and it's this, which is interesting. Suppose you have a surface in M3, nice smooth two-dimensional submanifold, C1 surface. Locally, it looks like a two-dimensional two -dimensional plane in two-dimensional space. And the surface contains all the points where x and y uh, are proportional. So, so what this says is if you, have, if you have a point that's not in that surface, x and y are not proportional. So that's interesting. I'm not assuming this surface N is invariant, which is very surprising. You can get away with this. Just that some surface, but this gives you some control over what happens to the vector field. Then, the conclusion is, and this is a recent paper uh, by Bonatti and someone in Santiago, and that was the first initial. I have references later. So that's an interesting theorem. <coughs> In fact, the only theorem I know about this generality is C1 vector fields and three-dimensional three dimensional manifolds. So this is a peculiar hypothesis, but it might be true in some situations. For example, the set of points where xp and yp are proportional might be itself be a, a surface. In that case, it's a surface. Here's a theorem I proved recently. Here we're back at a two-dimensional surface. Not so compact. You have two vector fields, x and y, y tracks x. These vector fields are only ck or some k. And now uh, suppose x is non-zero index, which we'll assume in all these. 
If x has a non-trivial k-jet at every point, that means, and it's finite k-voter Taylor expansion, the finite k-voter Taylor expansion is non-zero. For example, x could be real analytic. Might have that property. But if that's the case, and y is ck and tracks x, then it's conditioned. Yeah, if x is real analytic and y is only c infinity, then there is a k satisfying this. You can't have all the k jets of an analytic vector field vanishing at some point. At every point, there's some k which they don't all vanish. Then they don't all vanish in a neighborhood, and so you can build it up uh, to a whole compact set. And you only need a compact set containing the zero set of x, which is assumed to be compact. So who is the direct corollary of that? So the point of this theorem is that we reduce the hypotheses on y from analytic to just c infinity. So the important thing is that x has to be analytic for this theorem. Well, we can apply this to smooth group actions. So here's the definition, you know, your classical definition. The Lie algebra, finite dimensional, is super solvable if it's faithfully represented by real triangular, say, upper triangular matrices. Or algebraically, it means that the, um, the, the, the adjoint representation of the Lie algebra of the, of the Lie group or the Lie algebra, there, all eigenvalues are real. So it's very real, but it's stronger than so it implies solvable because these those groups of triangular matrices are solvable. It's weaker than nilpotent. Okay. So suppose M is a compact surface of non-zero Euler characteristic. G is a connected Lie group whose Lie algebra is super solvable, acting C infinitively, effectively on M. And then, and on some, I want to say there's an X like in the previous theorem. So we need to have a one dimensional, oops, a one dimensional uh, subgroup normal one-dimensional subgroup which, uh, on which the action is real or analytic. That might be the case. You might have an abelian action. One element, one generator is analytic and there's only C infinity and they can use, for example, that would satisfy this. Then the fixed point set is um, zero, the group action. So this is When G is analytic, I proved this years ago with Alan Weinstein. But it's a corollary of the previous theorem because you have X. You have what you have. So again, it's not the theorem itself is so fascinating, but there's some rich interplay going on which is not well understood. Because there's nothing like this in dimension five or more. None of these theorems are known in dimension five or more. So if we can understand these lower dimensional examples, we might get someplace. So, so here's a, a summary of what I said. <coughs> so x is non-zero index, which is always meaning zero set is compact. I don't look at this side for a while. <laughs> <laughs> X has non-zero index. G is a Lie algebra, finite dimensional, CK, tracking X. Then, in certain cases, all the elements of G vanish at a zero of X in certain cases. So what are these cases? Well, one is if everything's real analytic. That's one of the theorems. Another, if C1, but G is nilpotent. <coughs> 
another is k is c infinity, g is two dimensional, and x lies in g. X lies in G in this analytic in the theorem. Another case, M is a real three manifold. K equals one. G is abelian. It's dimensional. X belongs to G. This was Bonatti and Santiago. And then X is a real three manifold. K equals omega. G is abelian. It's dimensional. And X belongs to G. This, I guess, was, I proved this with Turiel. And Z, M is a complex manifold. And SL2C is not a quotient. So these are the summary of all of what I mentioned today. So one could make a huge uh, three by three or four by four matrix with differentiability, algebra, the unitivity of the vector field, the vector field belongs to algebra, the dimension of the manifold. Does it satisfy the conclusion? You know, yes and no, yes and no. Well, conjectures. The main conjecture I have, can any of the dimension restrictions be relaxed? We could also look at other Lie groups and special manifolds, but for the simplest to ask, any of this is valid in dimension five? Are the ones that are valid in dimension two, are they valid in dimension three? The ones that are valid in dimension three, do they extend to dimension four, and so on. So here's a conjecture which, as far as I know, is completely open. M is real or complex. G is a Nabilian Lie algebra of analytic or one vector fields. And some element has non-zero index. Then the whole the algebra vanishes at some point. <coughs> so it's sort of disgraceful. We don't know this even for dimension five. I think it's two in dimension. This theorem of uh, Bonatti about two vector fields, two commuting vector fields, some of those can be jacked up to arbitrary abelian just by a Dane's monoclonal, Zorn's monoclonal. I say all cases of dimension bigger than equal to three and G bigger than equal to three are open. Of course, if you look at dimension N equals eight and dimension G equals two, ask what about that case? Now this is something I know very little about tell you the map what I do know. Suppose the vector fields are polynomial. What about polynomial vector fields? What about a finite dimensional Lie algebra of polynomial vector fields? That's, that's kind of an interesting thing. It's, it's pretty simple. There aren't a whole lot of them in low dimensions. Dolgan act. Try to prove a conjecture, say for Polynomial vector, finite dimensional polynomial vector field on R3. Some element of this Lie algebra has non zero index. Does the whole, does the whole Lie algebra vanish at some point? So you've got to exploit algebraic. Or you could, instead of saying R3, you could say, well, what about some n dimensional variety? Sure. Now, a very interesting question is, what about <coughs> other fields? Um, trouble is defining the index. You can look at uh, fields that are uh, finite extensions of the reals, uh, what are they called, real closed fields, where sum of squares is non-zero. And some of that you can generalize just by using foundations. Theorems that if something is true, for some fields is true for all fields, other fields. Ah, here's an algebraic theorem. Go back to 1956 or something. Armand Borel, who was one of my teachers at Chicago. Suppose G is a solvable, irreducible, affine algebraic 
group over an algebraically closed field K. So you have to translate what those numbers are. It's a group of affine, it's represented by affine matrices, algebraic by matrices in a nice way. Then every algebraic action of G, see the action is algebraic, meaning it's uh, satisfied algebraic conditions both in the G variables and the, the algebraic variety which you need to to. Every algebraic action on a complete algebraic variety over K has a fixed point. Well, you have to understand what a complete variety is. If G is the complex numbers, complete just means projective. No, it doesn't mean supplied by projective variety. Some of them, which implies compact, but some of there are non-compact ones. Find very peculiar ways. You have to look at books by uh, a very good book by Humphrey and I'm just quoting this. But the point about this is, it's a fixed point theorem for group actions. In 56, nobody was really interested in that question except for finite groups and maybe the real numbers. There are very a few, and maybe in functional analysis, uh, there, was, there were some fixed point theorems, solvable groups, generalizing Brouwer's theorem. Uh, um, there are really only should interested in fixed points of discrete group actions. But Morel somehow, this occurred to him, and this is not hard to prove using everything Morel had done. Uh, this is a very nice proof in Humphrey's book on Lee algebras. Now this is generalized to a more analytic context by Somese. So now M is a compact, uh, complex manifold, which has the forms which make it a Kähler manifold, which is locally very much like the like CN. And you have to assume the first Betty number is zero. And now if you have an ordinary connected solvable complex Lie group, no, no algebra assumptions on the group, solvable. And if action is holomorphic, then there's a fixed point. So this is also very striking, I think. It shows that under strong analytic and algebraic conditions, there are analogous theorems, uh, quite well known to experts. So this is another direction one can go in. This specializes to the map. Here, this the manifold that's special. It's a Kähler manifold, and its first Betty number is zero. I suppose the necessity for that comes out of the proof. Okay, here's, I have two sets of references. This is one set, and there's four going on. So we've been looking at that. Here's Turiel. This is generalization of Lima's theorem about uh, action on the surface of the fixed point. Theorem Lima, Weinstein. Here's Bonatti's theorem that I referred to a lot. The inspiration for this paper is here. So that's been published quite a long time ago, 1992. Lima was a fellow student of Spaniard with me in Chicago, and then a few years later, after he got his degree, he published this theorem about two vector fields on the disk. Nobody was interested in it. I, I didn't know anything about dynamics then. I thought it was nice, but thought about it since then, until now. And, uh, okay, these so thank you very much. Are there any quick questions? Uh, the examples that uh, you mentioned for Maps, are you, you were efficient to the uh, non-differentiable to the boundary. Are there examples for closed surfaces? Um, yeah, for, for the, this is for the action for a group that uh, operates without a fixed point, that, that solvable group. No, no, the one for uh, the one that you described on the disk, and then you were. 
sense that doesn't use any high-powered theorems. All right, let's let's hold off questions for the rest of the questions until afterwards, and because uh, we'll come back at five after. Does that seem okay to you, Richard? Five after, we'll give a little ten-minute break, and uh, Lisa will talk. Thank you again.